Welcome back to The Debrief. We're here to talk about the 2023 Jakarta Speed World Cup. Uh, lots happened, not as many world records this time, but we've got uh, two world record commentators to talk about uh, what did go down in Southeast Asia this past weekend. As always, John Bergman is joining us. He writes the comp write-ups for climbing.com, and he is the author of High Drama, the Rise of fall and rebirth of American competition climbing. I almost messed up the name again. It seems to be a pattern. Uh, and then joining us uh, from speedclimbing.com or on YouTube, uh, just uh, look up at speedclimbing and on Instagram, uh, we have Josh Hurlebus, who has been doing uh, analysis and interviews of speed climbers and races on Instagram and on YouTube. You can see some great short form content if you're interested in seeing the splits between two athletes going through the different quarters of that speed race, breaking down what's already a short race into even smaller sections is fascinating. So make sure you subscribe to that channel, follow that Instagram handle. Uh, Y'all know how the debrief works. We're talking about the headlines and the winners and the losers. And as is now customary, the guest always has to go first, dropping their headline from the event. So Josh, Hit us with it. What was the uh, what was the top story from Jakarta? I mean, I feel like IFSC's YouTube channel just like knew what I was going to talk about because they put out their athlete of the week, uh, athlete of the competition. Uh, I think it was this morning, and it was Ola. And of course, it has to be Miroslav. Seven in a row, undefeated for these seven comps in a row, seven World Cups in a row, um, continuing to, to raise the bar, lower the time, however you want to say it, for women's speed climbing. And doing it in such conv convincing fashion that uh, it it's true. Like she, we're living in the era of Ola right now. She's the goat. Athlete of the week almost seems a little bit diminutive for somebody of her stature, right? You're like, I just surely I deserve a little bit more than just of the week, right? I, I love how that happens to go to like a, a legend like her. Yeah, absolutely. John, what did you take away from the women's speed this week? Well, I'll tell you, I, here on, on the debrief, we love debates that ultimately <laughs> cannot get solved, cannot get resolved. So I'll pose to both of you something that I put up on my Twitter right after the event, right after Ola had uh, another incredible performance. I'd love to get your opinions on this. Like I said, no, uh, not that we'll, we'll come to any conclusion. But I said on my, my tweet, here's a fun debate. Alexander, Alexander Miroslaw has been undefeated at World Cups since 2019. She's won multiple world championships, and she has set a world record seven times. So most of that is obviously she's breaking her own world record. And then you have Yanya Garnbrett, who has won 37, I think, 37 World Cups, give or take, 37 World Cup gold medals. She swept the 2019 Boulder season, and she earned Olympic gold. Uh, who who has what the more it? impressive comp I can't climbing even, resume? Like if you put either of them on e in each other's discipline, they're both gar like, and I say this <laughs> at a relative, like relatively garbage. They're both garbage asterisk at a World Cup level. I don't even know how to address those those kind of debates, man. It's like when Charlie mentions that, you know, Yanya should be compared to Tiger Woods. I'm like, I don't know how to relate those two things together. What, is, what does it mean to, to you know, win a bunch of uh, golf majors compared to winning climbing World Cups? I don't I don't know. I don't know if, you, if I can, I don't know if my brain can compute that much cross-discipline information. I think I just melt at that point. But I, I think uh, just with the particular achievements that we're talking about, she's got a long story streak of uh, competitions. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But that number of World Cup, or sorry, that number of world records is bonkers. And a huge asterisk beside this one is we don't have a complete history of speed world records, unfortunately. I am making like little chips away at trying to find the old ones. Um, but we can't definitively say, although I'm fairly certain that she is, of course, the the person that has the most world record, uh, 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 most world records straight up in speed climbing. Um, but just to go back to the uh, winning since 2019, this is something that's bothered me is that, you know, for me, the narratives of, of consecutive wins means you show up at all of them and you keep that streak alive. And I understand the strategy that she's got bigger things that she's fighting for. Last year, she stopped doing the World Cups to do Euro champs. And this year, she's going to stop, as she announced in the interview, to focus on the World Championships to qualify for the Olympics. I get it. Just for me, it's such an unsatisfying story when it's not consecutive. Uh, uh, yeah, I, that is... And that's, a, that's big for her because she... She has been absent from some pretty significant World Cups and some World Cups where other people have done particularly well. Um, but on the flip side, I guess, if you could play devil's advocate, I, that also puts 
even more pressure on her when she is at a World Cup. It, it, she she doesn't come to every one, so there's a little more weight, a little more significance when she does actually attend a World Cup, uh, and she continues to keep that streak alive. So I I don't know, Josh. What do you think? I think I guess it depends on how you how, what angle you you analyze that at. I mean, yeah, it's like, oh, how do you define greatness? Is it by only by winning when you show up or is it by showing up more and continuing to win? Like, I mean, I can definitely see both sides of it. Um, I don't like comparing her to Yanya or I don't like comparing sports. Like, and I'm going to like, I do delineate speed. Like, it, you know, it's a different sport. It's entirely a different sport because Tyler's right. If you put either of them into their respective discipline, you're going to get a rather mediocre athlete. So, you know, these are highly specialized athletes that are able to do amazing things in their individual field. So comparing them is difficult for me. Um, see, from a, stri- from a strategy standpoint, like, I'm okay with what Ola does when she has other things she wants to focus on. Again, because as a professional a sport, which probably doesn't pay a whole lot um but you got to do also makes most sense for your professional like for your life so if that's by focusing on the other competitions and not the world cup so that way she can maintain sponsorships etc um wherever she uh you know wherever she's getting those from contractual obligations i'm not sure of you know the specifics of it but i'm okay with that um but i mean if you take like one thing I just want to say is like, if you take a look at like her average winning times over all the different uh, World Cups that she's won. Yeah. Yes. She's been pushing that lower as she hits the world record. But like her average winning times are better than most competitors PR. And that's like her average. Like she's averagely better than everyone else at their best. So to me, that's greatness. Are, are you ready to call her the goat, Josh, in, in women's speed climbing? Or is like Tyler and I are... <sighs> We certainly understand why people give that moniker to Yanya, but I think Tyler and I both agree where it's like, let's let's kind of wait until Yanya's career is done before we start, you know, giving that title because we don't we don't know where the end of that story is yet. And so does that same logic apply to Ola? Can I, can I just pipe in real quick? The, the other part, John, is that a lot of people like you talk about not knowing where the end of the story is a lot of people and like all three of us included to an extent we don't really know the beginning of the story for a lot of this as well record keeping is so bad and speed climbing by itself had so little coverage even in the age of multiple blogs and youtubers covering these world cups you will find the biggest climbing you know outlets uh, on the internet not covering the speed events even in the modern era from like 2013 and onwards so like is it you know uh Alex Alexander Miroslav versus Anna Jobert, yeah, possibly. But if you go before that, like, who are you comparing to? Also, it was a completely different sport before then. So, like, yeah, I think there's a lot of <laughs> subsets that make that such a such a hard question to answer. I'm willing to say greatest of the modern era, just because, again, like, we don't have that information. And you're right, the holds feel different. Um, like, it's like the beta is different. Everything about the sport, even like, I know people are going to laugh at that. Everything's about about the sport is different. But like there's significant enough things about the sport that are different from where it was back in the 2000s, et cetera, and through like the 10s that I would want to put that as, you know, an asterisk of the modern era, just so we can also see where her career goes. Because I do also have a question about exposure of women into the sport and whether or not we have a big enough sample size to under- to know whether or not she truly is this big of an outlier or if there is someone else who is just going to show up next year because now they've they've matured, they've hit a point in their career that they can put down the force needed to, to be fast, and now they're entering the scene at Ola's speed. Like that's something that could definitely happen as we see the sport expand. I, I just to to mention you talk about that idea of like exposure. In the last decade, there have been World Cups where there were fewer than 10 female competitors in a Speed World Cup, right? Like, we have not scratched the surface uh, in terms of number of people participating to actually figure out what a reasonable standard is. That's a great point to bring up. I, I don't even think we're even close here in the, at least, uh, you know, what I can speak for, what Josh can reference is the, the United States, where a lot of people that do excel in climbing in the in the teenage years, right? Middle school, high school. If they're going to get a college scholarship and pursue it in college, it's it, it's going to be in something other than climbing because that you can't get climbing <laughs> college scholarships right now. So you see a lot of the great climbers also being like multi-sport athletes. Maybe they also run track or, or gymnastics or something like that. And they end up getting a scholarship 
in that for college and they go off and they and they sort of focus on those other sports for their collegiate career and, and instead of climbing so once we can and i realize this isn't the end all be all uh, metric here but once we can maybe get some scholarships for climbing i i think we will see even more athletes entering speed climbing in particular Agreed. And not to dive too deep into this, because I know we just started, but uh, you look at the amount of speed walls that are in the U.S., like official IFSC 15 meter speed walls. There's a handful, but the U.S. is gigantic. So you have uh, a very disparate um, athletic population. It's not the same as in smaller countries or countries like Indonesia, where everyone camps together, all the best talent. So even if we do have this good talent, are they necessarily being trained to push as hard as they could be early enough on with that early exposure by having the everyday practices with the best of the best in their area to become even greater? So there's layers to this, but uh, I agree. The U.S. is nowhere near the, uh, achieving the potential that like we should be. Let me let me bring it back to Alexander Miroslav because I had a question that I wanted to ask you, and that is, is, is her exceptional performances right now coming from – uh, anything different strategically in terms of her beta, in terms of what we could get to see in the stream? Because like John and I were talking about before the show, we're kind of like, we're, we're our IQ drops by like 50 points when we start watching speed climb. It's just like, it's simply not where our, our strong suit, right? Um, So like, uh, is there stuff that you see when she climbs that is more complex than simply she does it faster? Like, is is she moving differently from the other top athletes? I will say that she is moving slightly differently than she was to compared to herself last year. If you look at the bottom half, specifically the bottom third of the wall, she is faster through the start and through the Tomoa essentially like um, that. She's probably as about a quarter second, almost faster than she was last year through that. Her other beta is like, from what I can tell is roughly the same. She's just more precise and she's just a much more refined level than where she was last year. Um, now you do see a lot of, a uh, um, lot more women that are using like her top beta when she's sideways to the wall. Yeah. And it kind of looks like she's like side skipping up the yes, last couple yeah. of foot holes before she <laughs> reaches for the top. Um, you do see some variations. Um, I believe it was, uh, I can't remember which Chinese athlete it was on that last pull, having to move over and sweep with the right hand to hit the button, to hit the, the sensor rather than the left hand, which is faster. So there are still people that are playing around with the top. Um, but everything I see from Ola is that it is so refined that I don't know where else she goes with this beta other than continuing to become somehow an even better athlete to make even more better advantage of it. Hmm. Huh. Yeah, yeah. Is there like, is there as much room for um, like, do you think the the women's side of the beta is a bit more optimized than the men's side? Like, I feel like the development we've seen from what I've heard has mostly kind of been on the men's side and then what can be used by the women is adapted and what can't they kind of got their own thing. So is that true? Or am I just kind of making stuff? No, up? I mean, um, uh, the, the a lot of the, um, the excitement that came from last year was the changing of the top beta um, when China came out when China was on the World Cup debuted essentially on the world cup scene what they had been doing for their top at their national championship the year prior that led to a lot of other people switching and now that's exclusively what people are using for the top beta so um there was a lot of excitement about that on the women's side again smaller sample size again not knowing you know what is optimal yet for the female competitors um i do think that there is room to grow especially if you're going to get a taller more powerful athlete they can experiment with some of the men's beta and do it successfully because you have men that are in the six five range using the five five beta just doing it more slowly like i'm not convinced that there aren't women out there that can do the same beta yet fascinating the the side step as you called it in the upper section is it's so fascinating to me because i notice it i don't know what it is about alexander but every time she does it, it it's it's like it it's so noticeable and i'm 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 thinking correct me if i'm wrong i'm like there has to be a way to do that it, it maybe in theory at this point but a little more um uh efficiently i suppose or aer aerodynamically because anybody who climbs knows that if you're sideways to the wall your your center of gravity is is is, is i mean you're not up against the wall right like you're you, so, so you're right um from a physiology standpoint you are drastically limiting the um strength and uh, ability for you to pull with the side that's against the wall because 
without getting too technical, like you really do pull better when you're able to also compress a little into the chest and like when you're pulling, just like with a pull up, et cetera. Um, so when you're rotated outward like that, cause you're against the wall, you're weaker. Um, so I think it's more of a function that it's better for leg position and how she's pushing up the wall at that point. And then through sheer mimicry, like the best is doing this. I'm going to do this. Other people have been doing it as well. Um, I would love to see um, females start experimenting with the, the, the top with the top beta that the men are using, just because if you're, if you're tall enough and you have even a modicum of power, it's, it's doable. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's what, exactly what I, I was thinking. And I'm just thinking we're just stunned here because we're like, man, we, we can't possibly like add anything to this, <laughs> to this like analysis of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. It, uh, anyway, that, n- enough said. But um, I just know whenever you're coaching, you would you would never tell somebody to, to do a move where you're standing with like sideways on a hold like that um, for maximum efficiency or maximum balance for that matter. Or, and even maybe upward propulsion, too. Um, so. It sounds like, uh, you know, we might see some changes. We'll see. I want to. I wanted to ask one last question, which was the fact that uh, the qualifying times were very fast um, in this World Cup, but we didn't see any world records. Can you? Is there any kind of like rationalization for that? Is that just like there, it was a good qualification day? Everybody was consistent, but you know, maybe because of the humidity, everybody wasn't quite as fast. Is that kind of ballpark idea of how it was working? That's my thought. Um, now. 96% humidity. It had been storming prior from what I understand. Um, uh, talking with some people that were there, like everyone was just drenched in sweat. Cause at that point with the heat and humidity, your body can't really cool down at that point. So, um, it's, it's not necessarily optimal for that, especially when you're thinking about the texture on the wall with that humidity is moisture sticking to that. Um, I know there were quite a lot of falls and slips compared to last week in Korea. Now Korea had a brand new wall. I heard a lot of stuff about how like that wall was just like chef's kiss when it came to texture and the way that it felt. Um, if I remember right, and I'm probably misremembering this wrong, I believe, uh, Albert told me that the wall they had in Jakarta was actually the one that they use in Innsbruck. Um, so like it is a, it is a wall that is, it's, it's fine. The athletes can do well on it, but I really do believe that the temperature was causing, I mean, that temperature, the humidity was causing people to hold back maybe just like a little bit, just to make sure that they had purchase on each of those holds before they push, because you just saw so many people like when you're at this level of speed climbing, they trust that the hold is there. So they are pushing through that hold before they even make contact with it and their feet were just blowing off of it. Yeah, I think it's the Chamonix wall. Uh, but yes, uh, so, yeah, 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 yeah. That that all makes sense. Um, John, let's uh, let's talk about your headline from uh, from this whole thing. Sure. Well, I I think we should talk about the Indonesians. I just I don't want to skip over them. Let's table that for a second because. Um, okay. Well, let I'm me sure. let me let me take mine. Let me let me okay, just take mine then because my um, mine is to talk about the men's side and to say that basically Rahajati absolutely saved the day you know taking the speed world cups to jakarta was really dependent on the fact that indonesians are killer speed climbers and when a country hosts a world cup it's usually because they want the opportunity for hometown athletes to win some gold in front of a crowd and in the finals things just started falling apart for the indonesian climbers um aspar aspar unfortunately gets like the brutal seed of being put up against the you know current world record holder vedrick leonardo and so there's the guy who won last year immediately out of the running in finals um vedrick loses in quarterfinals uh kiramel lost in semifinals right um, on the women's side, I, I'm just going to say DMRK if everybody understands that I'm not going to be good at pronouncing like uh, Dezak, Made, Rita, Kasami, however however far that name goes. I mean, no disrespect, but um, yeah, DMRK gets to the final, but you're competing against Alexandra Miroslav. And so, of course, that's uh, that's going to be a silver right there. But to end it all, and of course, the storybook is, you know, it's the final race of the entire event. And so you've got the wiry um, you know, weird haircut, uh, Raharjadi Nursamsa going up against, uh, was it Chinchin uh, Wang who had knocked out Kiram al Beta that just looks absolutely frantic. And maybe it is kind of because of his frame and the whack like haircut. It's just like, he seemed like the anti-speed climber for a moment and he gets to win it in front of his home crowd. Frankly, after he sh- 
probably shouldn't have even got past, you know, the round of 16. It was wild, but it was extremely satisfying to have a new hometown champion, like an unlikely hero for this event, take the gold medal. So I uh, I thought that was my headline. It can't be Ola, um, but it, it satisfied the requirement to get some Indonesian gold at this thing. Let's talk a little bit more about Kiro Mal, because I think... Going back to <laughs> That's a solid our... Don Cherry moment right there. It's like, screw the game, kids at home. We're going to talk about Kiramal now. <laughs> no, this all ties into the, the, the Indonesian squad on the whole. Because I think, going back to our previous episode when we talked about Seoul, back to a, a year or so for now, there's always been this cosmic seeming link between Kiramal and Vedrik, right? It, it always seems how somehow there's this... Like well, they're any, just the anything... two best. Like they're just the two best guys. I think. That, yeah, I think it, that's and it. it's 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 almost like anything you can do, I can do better, right? And they sort of have just trading great results, trading landmark results, and and so even though it was it's Vedrik that got the the world record in Seoul, Kiramal had held it for obviously you know last season, and so I think heading into this event in Jakarta. Since Vedrik did have such a great showing in Seoul, I was thinking, okay, this is going to be Kiromal's turn, right? Vedrik took the spotlight last time. Now we're going to have Kiromal, and this is the dance that we've been doing for a long time. That's what's going to happen here. And it started out seeming that way, right? Uh, Kiromal, he ran like a 511 in qualies, and then he got even better, a 503. Really solid times, and then gets into the final round. Uh, Five two five, I think, was his first t- in the in the beginning of the final round bracket. He gets a a win. I think he gets a five oh seven then, and then he has that just bad foot slip in a pretty sloppy small final race. And it, as Tyler, you kind of explained how <laughs> it all kind of came tumbling down from there. I'm watching this and I'm kind of thinking the biggest surprise of all for me is that. It doesn't really feel like we've gotten that rocket fuel yet from Kiramal this season. Two events into it, right? He, in the Seoul Qualies, he was he, he ran a six three two and a five seven one. So obviously there were some. You know, some yeah, I was going to say I, I want to say that last last comp was hopefully an outlier, and I'm willing to give him that for now. But the thing about Jakarta is now that we've seen this one play out, and we saw how last year played out, is you say there's almost like a curse for those two guys who, if you have to pick your like. If you pick your Indonesian favorite, it's going to be one of those two. And neither of them have managed to snag that gold yet. It goes to somebody else on the team every time they visit the home country. So I'm at this point, I'm going to say the first event was just a, a bad day. And then this one was just like bad luck and just kind of a curse. But yeah, I don't know. But I think if you had if we had had to you know, make a prediction heading into this season, who is going to be the first person to go sub five? Who's going to be the first person to get a world record? I think logic would have t- told you it was going to be Kiro Mal. And here we are two events into the season. The world record has gone sub five a couple times and Kiro Mal hasn't, hasn't gone sub five yet and hasn't, hasn't won a gold. It's, it's been a surprising couple of comps to start the season for Kiro Mal. Yeah. Um, it's, it's tough when, from what I hear, he's dealing with potentially an injury um, happened just before um, Seoul. And so going into any sort of competition where you're not trusting your body to operate optimally, I can understand why there might be some issues. Um, he did look much better and much more confident in Jakarta. I also wonder if not having the world record anymore kind of took a little bit off his shoulders when it came to expectations and pressure. Um, I have no idea when it comes to, you know, um, like psychology, like how he is when it comes to handling pressure. But we have seen that he doesn't win as much as he sets world records. So that makes me think, is there something to that? Did, did losing the world record actually set him up to lower the world record again by having that weight off his shoulder? So now he can just compete and just, to have more fun rather than having everyone expecting him to do that. So um, uh, I did do a brief time in from one of his uh, um, um, qualifying rounds when he was looking fast in the bottom section, his zero to five time is faster than his world record was last time. Um, he hasn't synced everything together. So I do expect that if his um, elbow is healthy at the next world cup that we'll see that we see a sub five, but 
is he going to be the only one? No, we know Leonardo can do it. And I fully expect that some of the Chinese athletes dip under as well. We also have Sam Watson. So will it be enough at that point? I don't know. Maybe, you know, maybe it's just Olympic strategy. You know, he's taking it easy right now. And then at the Olympics, he's going to go sub four, you know, maybe that's <laughs> the plan the whole time. Let me actually, let me breach a topic because we're, we're about to, there's a good chance we have to talk about it at Salt Lake City, which is the idea of athletes not being at peak form, still bothering to compete at World Cups, even though they are not a requirement for the Olympics this time around. So Natalia is the, is the one that we've been talking about who has not been having a great season so far over the first two events and all of us know that there are these like mitigating health issues that everybody's uncertain about. Um, and same maybe could be said uh, based on what you're saying for Kiramel. And unlike the last Olympic circuit, uh, last Olympic cycle, getting good scores in the World Cups mattered for 2020 because that was how you got to the bulk of qualification spots was to have a good performance in the World Cup season. Um, that is not a factor at all this year. So why does it matter to even show up if you're injured? Like, I like the approach that Kokoro is taking. He tweaked his elbow and he is bailing on Salt Lake and possibly on Prague. We'll see what happens. Um, whereas we see these two athletes who are not doing well. I, I don't think Kiramel is doing that poorly, in my opinion. I think he's doing probably fine. Um, but if you have an injury, aren't these the events to skip right now? If the whole point is the world championships in like three months? If I'm the coach, yes. I mean, you look at the intensity that your body experiences in a competition and it's higher than anything you experience in training. So if you have little injuries that you feel in training, that's not going to get better by increasing the intensity that you experience. So me personally, since these aren't necessary to hit Olympic qualifying, I'm backing out of these until I'm healthy and I know that I'm able to compete how I need to. Um, again, I don't know if as it's a new sport, as people are getting new sponsors, et cetera. I don't know if there are specific um, X amount of competition obligations within other um, contracts that they may have. Um, I do I do know that you see that oftentimes in the track and field, field world, that they'll have to compete at X number of competitions in order to qualify right. for the season bonus, et cetera. And, and actually, can I bring up one? I, I said that it's not like doing well in, in the World Cups doesn't get you to the Olympics. For some countries, they will use the World Cup results to determine who gets to be on their team for World Championships. So I should back that up a little bit. I don't think that's the case for Natalia. I imagine she is on already the Olympic designate team. I don't know what happens in Indonesia, but anyway, that might be that might be a possible requirement. Not too sure. It kind of brings us back to Alexandra, right? Because if there's one athlete that we've seen that picks and chooses which comps she goes to, it's as we just said a few minutes ago, it's it's Miroslav. And of course, this has been kind of the exception so far in that. Yeah, she I mean, I don't know what's in her contract to your point, Josh, but like logic would tell you, yeah, maybe she didn't have to do these these World Cups uh, with the World Championships looming months away at this point, but she's she's here and and um, you know if she wins better for it, if she obviously. wins Salt Lake City and then skips the next World Cup, my brain's gonna explode because it, like I, we've talked about this last season was the amount of women that have done four like had four wins in the calendar consecutively is like crazy small, right? And if you can get five, you're the first person to do it. And the fact that last year she won three in a row and then was just like, nope, I'm out. And if she does that again, like my my brain's going to fall apart. It's so unsatisfying when you're like, if you just show up, you're probably going to win. You win everything you show up to. You drive me crazy. I want to go back to uh, Raharjati Nursamsa though. Um, Talk to me about, did you guys see anything different when he was climbing? Because I think, and again, it might have been the build. I think the haircut might have had a lot to do with it. That ridiculous mullet that was just turned up to 11 just made him such such a funny climber to be watching. But one big component of all this was his very first race in finals. Um, Josh, I wanted to ask you about this one in particular, and maybe you can just summarize this run because it's kind of the, it's the clown car race of the whole event, frankly, and it <sighs> creates such fascinating context for the fact that he ended up winning a gold medal. Oh my goodness. Like I feel for Mateo, man. Like, um, it's one thing to miss, to miss the sensor, but like multiple times it's going to, that's gotta be a source of, of frustration. Uh, so anyway, uh, you know, You've got Matteo, you've got uh, uh, Marjati, and... Yeah, Matteo Zorloni like, from Italy, just to, just to clarify what the race was, yeah. 
Um, uh, so like they both slip in the race and like typically what I, what I say is like, if you're going to slip in the race, slip first, because if the other person slips, you're going to be able to catch up and beat them. But not this time because (laughs) Mateo misses the sensor and Rajati is able to then bypass him because he's now fully off the wall, climbs over. He advances with, I don't remember what was like an eight second something. I think it was. And then without that happening, we don't get this Indonesian victory probably. It was it was messed up because they both slipped basically at the same time. And then uh Rahajati slips again, which is what gave uh uh Mateo the lead. So so <laughs> you slip twice. How do you possibly recover from that? And that just it was just a complete comedy of errors. It's like the nightmare race for speed climbing where you're like nobody walks away from this looking good. Um, but yeah, it was something else. And looking back on that after you see the end of the event is just is befuddling. It, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm looking here at my my notes, how I annotated it as it was happening. I said they had decent starts and it's it's neck and neck. Then Mateo slips, uh, which it seems like Nursam's uh, like hesitates, like maybe out of the corner of his eye, he saw that slip. I'm not really sure, but something happened there. Um, and, and because of that slip, which Mateo was kind of pulling away at that point, they become neck and they get neck and neck again. Uh, and then Mateo starts to pull away and, and misses the buzzer. I, I said, it's, it's like the most dramatic 8.9 seconds you're ever going to say. I think, uh, I think, I don't know the winning time, 8.91. So, um, yeah, if you're Mateo, I said this before we started recording, if you're Mateo's coach, uh, you know what you're, you're drilling this, <laughs> this week or, or until the next comp, it's that buzzer finish, which also proved to be, uh, st- to stymie Mateo and qualies as well. Just brutal. There were, there were a couple of good coach cam moments. I wish we got that one. I wish we got the Italian coaches for that uh, <laughs> for that moment. Um, but yeah, that was my headline. Was uh, was was that Indonesian goal just for an unlikely team member? Um, John, let's let's talk about yours if you uh, if you want to. What's kind of the follow up? The the runner. Yeah, admittedly lost in the shuffle of the talk about Alexandra and and the Indonesian squad is that here's my headline. Japan is. Maybe we'll put that in in parentheses. Japan is maybe becoming a powerhouse in speed, or we should say at least kind of on its way to ma- on its way to maybe becoming. Right? How's that sure. For, for, uh, but of course, this is all on on June uh, Yasukawa and his great performance. He finished in seventh place, uh, not quite his best World Cup place. I think he was sixth at Salt Lake in. 2021 but it's close but more important than his place to me was his time he clocks a 5.22 i think we were saying here i think that's a new japanese national record and what's interesting there is a 5.2 puts japan right up with as far as i'm concerned like the best of the best countries because let's not forget that up until a couple of weeks ago the u.s record was 5.2 5.2 right it was Brosler's 5.20 and so we've seen that it's you know to go from 5.2 to 5 5 flat you know it, it's very possible so I think June really put Japan in terms of its time in the men's division in a really good standing at this comp and on top of that it remains to be seen but let's see if some of that communal training that we've seen from the Japan squad in bouldering and in lead that has led to them being so successful, becoming that assembly line where they, they train together, they train really hard together and they're able to just churn out competitor after competitor. That's at the tip top. Let's see if that can translate to speed. Uh, Maybe June here will inspire some of the other uh, Japanese teammates to, to start pushing the level a little bit in speed. And and like I said, maybe they'll become a powerhouse. I, I, I don't know if we're there yet, but I think this was an important first step towards that. And kind of going along with that, I mean, last week, I think it was, you spoke about the eastward shift of speed climbing. So, you know, you've got China, Indonesia, June with Japan. You've got uh, Yun Chol Shin from Korea hitting a 527. Like, there are, there it, it, that, that's speed central. If you're talking about, like, you want to, like, put a map out there and throw a dart, like, where do you, where do you want all the speed people? To, like, that's where they are. That's a terrible analogy, but you get what I mean. Like, like 
it wouldn't surprise me as we see more and more speed people uh, come from that area that maybe we start seeing more World Cups out there. Or maybe, like, ideally, I would love to have, like, individual just speed circuits that can have meets out there. But uh, it is 100%. Uh, oh, where was I going to go with that? Uh, so, June, as you were saying with Japan, like, looking at the Japanese training system, is this kind of like that the tip of the iceberg where this is going to be what right what right raises all the other competitors up to that level um clearly whatever training june is doing is working um what else is in the pipeline is what i want to know and how quickly can we see it the only thing that's concerning to me to that point is the speed walls or the lack of speed walls in japan because it there it's one thing with the bouldering gyms because we've seen that there are so many of those hard bouldering gyms all around Japan, in the cities, tucked into the into the shopping malls and all of that. Uh, it's You can't really do that with a speed wall. I don't really know how robust the, the speed training system, uh, or I should say the infrastructure is in Japan. I haven't seen a whole lot of social media posts about people training speed all over Japan, like you see it kind of training, bouldering all over Japan. Uh, so that, that, to me, is kind of the big question mark or the big X factor in all of this, because I think... The, the a country can only progress uh, at, at a certain rate related to the the walls that are available for them to climb and train on. So I, you know, I, it remains to be seen. But uh, June is obviously training somewhere and it's working. So just for a, a little bit of, uh, of context, talking about this rise, like the, the Japanese speed team, if you go by like the team World Cup rankings for this year. And again, we're only two events into the season. Team Japan is far ahead of Kazakhstan, Ukraine. Right. Those are, well, particularly the Ukraine, like a huge uh, uh, historical speed country, Iran. Right. So the days of Reza Ali Porshena and all of the, the couple other climbers that came up with him, Spain. And that's mostly like uh, Eric is, has not had a, a great couple of weekends. Um, but yeah, Japan is is above a bunch of countries that you would say should have quite a lot of points in the ranking so far based off the last couple of seasons or the long history of speed climbing. So you're right. The concentration of uh, of Asian countries that are taking over the top is uh is pretty remarkable absolutely um i want to talk about winners uh from this event um josh hit me with uh with what you got from this we kind of I mean, broke down most of the actual gold medal winners but let's expand um uh, for me it's the entire indonesian speed team men's and women uh i just they just showed up i mean it's their home it's their home world cup i would expect them to have a good showing and not just like from like the pomp and circumstance. Like I love their opening ceremonies that they do. Like I love everything. It seems like a really big party when they host these in Jakarta. But uh, I mean, you look at the athletes on the men's side. You've got going on um, one and three. There's three people. They made three people made it into the quarterfinal, and there were six that made it into the total final at, um, at the into the knockout stages. The men's side. Um, for the women, they got four into the finals, and uh, um, Desac Desac won. I mean, sorry, did not win. Took second. But what I wanted to say is, she went six five two, mm. which is the f it, it's a record for Indonesia. It is the fastest someone not named Ola has gone, and <laughs> it is completely like you could see that the win meant a lot for Ola because I think she actually felt pressed. That was a race. And like that was that was a real race for the gold medal, man, for real. It was. And to me, seeing that she didn't back down from the fact that you're going against Ola, like like, no, I'm going to beat you. I have what it takes. That was a massive moment for me. Like, yes, she took second, but like that was a huge part of the meat of the um of the cup for me that just had me super excited. How big of do you think that intimidation factor is when competitors are going up against Ola? Because she's, what, 29 years old, I think? So she's been on the circuit for a long time. Like we said, she's got seven world records to her name. I mean, there's, it's almost like... I, hate to keep bringing it up, but it's almost like that Yanya effect, which we've talked about with, with women when they're lining up on the boulder mats against Yanya. It, 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 you wonder... Is there something there that really gets in their head by just the, the sheer presence of this person, this this living legend right next to them? Yeah, I mean, when you know that you're lining up against someone who, if it's a good day, will break the world record, and you know that you have not gone that fast before, it means that you have to operate at your absolute best to have even a shot of beating her at her not best. So that, that's going to play with you mentally in some way, unless you're all but the most just 
confident athlete, which you're a professional athlete, you're going to have confidence. Yes, you've done enough in training and in competitions to have the confidence, but there's something about going against someone that you know is better than you. Um, it, it does play with your mind a little bit. Um, it's just co- commenting on, on your mention of like the party that goes on. Like it, it does look like, um, and this is a good thing. It looks like there is still a little bit of, of uh, novelty to everybody involved running the Jakarta World Cup. Like at any World Cup, you will find a handful of people where running the event is like the most important thing to them. And otherwise, for everybody, they're kind of used to doing it. It's just another event. We're just a live streaming company doing whatever we got to stream. We're just a tent company putting up tents wherever you know we get hired. At this event, because it's so new, but because there's so much pride in that, it does feel like every single person involved was like bringing their A game and very excited to make this show and make this event huge. Um, it was cool seeing like every volunteer that I could see on the screen, all of it just seemed to be full of just like, this is the most important thing we could be doing right now. And that's the best when when everybody's on the same page about how much this matters to them. And, uh, that felt very cool. And I, I hope that energy sticks around for uh, for a long time. Like just, if you've, been, if you've been running World Cups in Chamonix for a couple decades, like, you know, it kind of becomes old hat after a while, right? That's just what happens. You still do a great job and you still care about it, but it's cool when it is like something, something new and you're, and you're just putting your entire heart into it. So, uh, it, it came across is what I mean to say that, uh, it mattered to everyone. Yeah. Great crowd. I mean, it was just like good energy. It, it just, it was good. It was fun comp. I know that we'll, there were some, some audio, uh, technical issues, but, uh, it just really looked like a fun time to mm-hmm. be there. So, yeah. Yeah. John, did you have a particular winner? Like aside from the headlines? Yeah, I, I know people accuse me of always choosing the Americans. I don't want it to seem that way, but I do want to give props to Emma Hunt. I would put her in my winner list, and I'm not just saying that to to sort of be biased. I she she as she wrote on her Instagram, two weeks, two World Cups, Seoul and Jakarta, and two American records. That is fantastic she she sets a new record here 6.79 seconds was her is the new american women's record and uh, exciting for american fans is up next uh salt lake city we know that she shines there she got a silver there last year um i think she stumbled in the final uh, against miroslav but uh emma hunt just remains the queen of american women's speed climbing and the field is probably going to look a lot different uh, when we get to Salt Lake City. Like certainly not as many athletes going over Indonesia just by the, you know, check my video on how you qualify for World Cups, guys, like link in the bio or whatever. Uh, but yeah, Indonesia can't send as many people because it's not a home World Cup and things like that. So I think uh, I think she'll have a, a great shot in uh, in Salt Lake City for sure. Yeah, the, the world record or the uh, national record thing. I'm glad that people like you, John, are, are keeping track of that. You, Josh, as well, like you're aware of these things. And it would, would really be nice if the broadcast um, had a database linked into the IFSCs, which I feel like shouldn't be that hard considering how many countries are using Vertical Life now for their databases. I know it's not all of them. I understand a lot of them have legacy systems that they're very invested in. I get it. Um, but it would be nice if not just continental records, but also being able to mention new national records without having, you know, your co-commentator be somebody that is a is, uh, you know, from that country, right? You're lucky when we get that opportunity, but it would be nice. Um, my, my winner from this, just to kind of tie into the broadcast point, we can talk about them in a second was the fact that we actually get to see qualification rounds now for two world cups in a row. And we kind of glossed over it last week because I wasn't sure if it was going to happen again, or if it was just going to be a one-time thing. But, uh, like John said, uh, last week, it's nice having it, knowing that all of these, um, uh, world records have typically in the last couple of seasons been broken then, but it's cool because there's lots of people trying to watch, um, people in the discord, like are, are up super freaking early to, to be watching speed qualifiers. And it, it almost makes it even further argument that maybe some people would show up for like a boulder qualification round, even though those are much, much longer. But I, I think it's really cool that the diehards, like the anoraks of this sport, are getting something to sink their teeth into, right? Like, I'm sure they're the kind of people that would even watch, like, the practice round if they had the opportunity. But I love that that's expanding a little bit. I hope it's not costing too much. 
um, it's it's something new for everybody to be excited about. So that was kind of my winner from the event. My follow-ups for that was Canadian team actually putting in times and not falling so much. So good job to the Canadian athletes. I, I'm, I hope you guys found your footing. Um, and I was also going to mention Darren Skolnick uh, from a broadcast perspective of, I think he did a good job for uh, for finals. He's he's really got an ESPN voice, which, uh, which some people just kind of, you know, develop the second you've got a microphone and a camera in front of you, but he did a good job. I was, uh, I was happy with uh, how he was uh, adapting to the way Matt commentates. Um, but yeah, um, having qualifications streamed. What, uh, what do you guys think? Um, I was really happy seeing one and a half of the qualifications streamed so far. <laughs> um, that, that is the know, flip uh, side to it for this event. I woke yeah. up early. Like I had a, I had a full pot of coffee brewed. Like I was ready to go. And then I turn on the stream and it is just like being like five frames per second. No sound. Terrible buffer. Was it actually um, that bad? And it, was, it, was, it was disappointing. It, it was disappointing Sucks. for um, for me as a fan. Um, let alone if you're someone who has an athlete there that's trying to trying to compete and you weren't able to, to travel with them, being able to see that live in what is essentially like uh, someone taking pictures and just like texting just you pictures. That's how motion bad basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm glad they got it sorted out. But this I mean, I'm, I'm going to sound pretty harsh on them, but this is rookie stuff that they that they, they're, they're failing at. Like, it's not hard to set up a, a live stream you could just do like a Logitech web camera and a laptop that would have been higher quality than what they were able to put out for the Damn. women's qualifiers. That's how, I went back last night to, to try and watch the qualifications and, and I discovered that, yeah, the, the women's basically doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. So I assumed it was bad, but I didn't, uh, based on the comments, I wasn't quite sure if it was just like people were losing their connection or whatnot. Cause I did wake up for qualifiers and about 30 seconds later, I decided no. I'm <laughs> sleeping today. I need to. <laughs> so I, I didn't actually tune in live for qualities, but I saw some of the chatter in the discord about it being rough, but I didn't know how rough. John, you you also experienced it uh, as it happened, right? I did. I was, uh, as we said here before we started recording, I was I was <laughs> basically the one person that was awake and up at the coffee shop sitting there by myself with the the barista. And uh, um, I was just like waiting and waiting and, and kind of bummed out. And I guess to the IFSC's credit, they did fix it. Right. And, and, or they, I, I think they, they ended that stream and then they restarted a new stream or something like that. And I don't know if that was, I don't know if they were seeing the chatter on, on Twitter or social media that was happening where people were telling them this, this stream isn't working or if whether they realized it themselves, but uh, good on them for that, uh, fixing it because, and it was right around the time I was ready to pack up. You know, I was like, okay, this is, I'll, you know, I'll go back to bed or whatever. And and then I just saw, oh well, they they did put this notice on Twitter saying we're aware of the problem, we're going to try and fix it, and and so they did. So that was good. Um, so yeah, yeah, <laughs> it would have been nice to see the whole thing, but a little bit's better than nothing. From from what you guys did see from this event, and I guess if it was that bad this time, maybe talking more about Seoul, but um. Uh, do you feel like it's, it's valuable as a viewer? Like I've been watching it mostly as a novelty sort of, right? Like I only watched it once this time. I didn't tune in cause I just, I was simply too tired to be up that early. Um, but, uh, do you think this is something that you think, you know, I think in Seoul, there was like about a thousand concurrent viewers. The one time I, I took a look at it, it could have been more or less cause I don't, I keep it full screen, uh, almost the entire time, but do you think that's going to die off? Like, is this a good spectator round, especially without commentary? Um, I'm assuming they didn't do commentary for qualifiers this time. Yeah. Did they have sound at least? Partway through? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, All right. So. Sounds about the yeah. same then. Yeah. Like is, yeah. It, is so far, like it seems like they're, they've committed to only doing a couple of the world cups for this so far. Like I think Salt Lake city is the furthest that they've been willing to, to promise it, I guess. Um, yeah. What do you think? Like, is it a, is it a compelling product at this point or does it need to be improved? I mean, I mean, <laughs> well, Maybe maybe they're not putting it up as a product as well. Like it might right. just be we're gonna have a camera pointed at it anyways to service. capture the World Cup. So like here we'll just you know plug it in. Yeah, I appreciate it because if a world record is set in qualities, I'd like to be able to see that live. Mm -hmm. um, I have some issues with how they film as well in the qualifying round. They zoom in much. They had two cameras set up, which I believe was the first that they've done that. Um, rather than showing them uh they the did have time. it at seoul and i know that because they had the two lanes flipped for a while which was really jarring if i if i remember right they had like a on one side b on the... anyway go ahead 
they did that for a couple of runs uh, for qualities as well. I remember one Kiramal was supposed to be in B, and you know, he was he was on the left side of the screen. I'm like, wait, what? What time is yeah. this? Like, did I miss half the rounds? Like, so that was a little frustrating. But more more so, like they were zoomed in very far to the point where, like, if you're looking at each of the competitor, you've got their head and their arms are reaching above the screen, and their feet are pushing below the bottom of the screen, and you have no context for where they are on the wall if you're a casual fan. Like, if you know the wall, like, yeah, you know where they are. But from a casual fan standpoint, they're also zoomed in far enough. You can't tell where they are in relation to the competitor, to, like, who they're racing. Right. So it's all just, just, like, nebulous. Hey, people climbing up a wall. And then, oh, they slapped first. So I guess they were further ahead type of thing. It's, I would like to see it run a little bit more like how it is in finals. But beggars can't be choosers. I will take this all day over not having it, ever not having it streamed. Yeah, we're we're probably not the best sample to ask this because I think we'll tune into to, to <laughs> comp, yeah. you know World Cup climbing uh, whatever quali rounds or whatever no matter no matter what as long as it's on. Uh, but I I do think that there will be significant fan interest for these speed qualies at least as long as these world records are getting broken with this degree of frequency. Uh, now, if the world records really start to plane out a little. Like Reza's record, two thousand. He said it in two thousand seventeen. So by two thousand, you know, eighteen, nineteen. I don't know if people would have been as interested in uh, tuning in because you just kind of forget uh, uh, after a while about like, oh, there could be a world record broken here, you know. But um, but yeah, I think as long as, I mean, as we're uh, two events in and we've seen world records broken at half of those. So um, I think as long as that's there's potential for that, people will keep tuning in. I I I'm just really happy they're, yeah, beggars can't be choosers. I guess to Josh's point. That 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 take is too level-headed and intelligent for the internet. The, that's uh, not incendiary enough for the comment section, unfortunately. But anyway. I mean, well, I can, I can before, be harsher. Yeah. <laughs> John, go well, ahead. Well, before we move on, I, w- I wanted to ask something here. We, we talked about Emma, and and we mentioned Darren Skolnick, so we're kind of dancing around the the U.S. squad on the whole. And Josh, since you are so in tune with the U S squad and you had, you kind of had them analyzed heading into the season. Tyler and I have discussed, uh, whether or not we've been surprised at the U S's bouldering squad, their performance so far this season. So I'm wondering, thinking back to where you were when the season we were in the preseason and what you were expecting for this season at this point, two comps in, how are you, is the U.S. squad where you expected? Are are you surprised? Are you disappointed? And and I'll I'll, I'll shout out some results here just to give some people some reference. Um, these are just places. These aren't times. But uh, at Seoul, the U.S. men, Sam Watson ninth place, John Brosler twelfth, Zach Hammer twenty eighth, Noah Bracci thirty first, Merritt Ernsberger thirty ninth, and the women Emma seventh, Piper Kelly twenty sixth, Sophia Curcio thirtieth, Callie Close was thirty. Third, I believe. Um, Jakarta, Sam 6th, Brosler 23rd, Merritt Ernsberger 31st, Noah 39th, Zach Hammer 58th, on and on. The women, Emma 7th, Piper Kelly 26th, uh, Liberty Ronalds 27th, Sophia Curcio 28th, Callie Close. Down, actually, I don't think Callie Close was there in Jakarta. But so it's, you know, it's kind of all over the place with the results, quite the spread. Um, what do you think? What's been your take? I, I guess um, when you look at how they've performed so far. Yeah. I mean, I kind of have two minds of it where from a fan and why would I start with this? Cause it's going to sound pessimistic, but from a fan, it is a little lackluster of a showing aside from Sam and Emma. Um, and I, I don't mean that with any disrespect, but going into this season, we knew that John was at a 5.2 had the American record. We knew Sam was, was up and coming, but he hadn't, I mean, last year he was not at that level speed wise yet in competitions. Um, uh, so we know coming into the season, we're going to have a 5.2 Sam posts online, his uh, sub five training run. We know, okay, the speed is here, but, but where is it now? Other than just with Sam, like um, now I get it. Like, like I said, from two minds, like from a coaching standpoint, if world cups don't matter when it comes to Olympic qualifying and it's Olympic qualifying year, are you buried in training right now? And that's why they're not performing because they're just using these as essentially fun training 
fun training sessions, knocking the rust off from World Cups, knowing that they're going to deload and peak later for the for the um, Olympic qualifying, and that's when we're going to see all the good times drop. That's a huge possibility because that's exactly what I would do if I had athletes competing right now. But from a fan position, we're not privy to that information, so all we see are world records and other national records being lowered. But the U.S. as a team not keeping pace. We have our standout individuals, but as a, from a team standpoint, it feels like they're not keeping pace. What do you think, Tyler? I think speed is one of the couple is really the only discipline in climbing where I feel a little bit like I have an easier time of um, making intelligent analysis of uh, expectations because in bouldering it's you know, you can say like, wow, this person came 10th, right? That's so much lower than their typical first places. But then you look at the scores of boulders and tops and and you and I know the difference between earning a, a, a zone and a top can be miles or it can be millimeters, right? It can be really deceiving what it is that differentiate uh, like separates you from first place to 20th place um, with speed it's a lot easier because you can interpret the rank and you can also interpret the time and I think with a few of the, the climbers that we were talking about there their times aren't that far off and I think sometimes you're looking at individual races or you're looking at you know one bad weekend and we're only two events in and so it doesn't panic me that much right um, but also I, I refuse to be baited by the selective videos put on the internet of the best time you did right so I'm not like nobody's getting me with Sam's like sub five time I know he's fast that's awesome but you can just hear from the shock of the people in the video that that was an exceptional moment right there were people celebrating and kind of like being surprised and wowed at that time that he put up in that video that he shared I don't know how many runs people typically do in an average day of speed training but to the people People watching that was exemplary right that was to them a rare occurrence for it to merit that kind of response and so no i i think he could hit that time i think he could go sub five this year but i'm not expecting that shit i'm not expecting it from mateo or ludovico because one video was posted of them in like one particular race like no i'm not going to get baited by that so so i think the john browser one is a is a good example of of you know we see his races in real time we know he can be a good speed climber hasn't come up this year so far but it's not that far off so i'm not too worried among your top competitors and i don't think i've i've like i think the american squad you guys have a few more guys at the top than canada does like we have very few names in climbing it is just sean it is just alana and every once in a while some of our lower tier athletes manage to have a blip right you guys have a deep bench in the in the top ranks but also a deep bench in the lower ranks and i don't think i've ever like kind of expected too much from the lower ranks just yet so so i think my expectations aren't too far off from what your team has uh, has done so far but um but yeah i see that all through maple leaf colored glasses so maybe <laughs> i'm not the guy to ask and yeah, I, I mean, I shouldn't be that pessimistic because you're right. When it comes to like the second tier, second tier, you know, quotes. But, uh, you know, with Merritt and Noah, like I'm very excited about them performing well. And they are performing well. You look at the times from last year, et cetera, and, like they are doing well. I, as a fully patriotic American, see the whole rest of the world starting to go sub five. And I'm like, when? Yeah. Do it now. Where's so, where's your like, space race now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Well, we lost the moon to Indonesia. So the space race is over. Disaster. Yep. Oh well. Um, I wanted to talk about uh uh speaking of space races, by the way, I want to talk about Russia for a little bit. Um and uh uh, believe it or not, there are Russian speed climbers, which if you started watching speed climbing in the last couple months, you might not actually know that. But Russia has a notorious record as uh, probably the most dominant speed country in the history of the sport. Um, they aren't allowed at World Cups right now. You can say what you want about that. But they have a robust scene of domestic competitions while their athletes are, are barred from competing on the World Cups. And so we're getting to see live streams and videos. You can find it all right now on uh, Russia's YouTube channel. And I wanted to talk about them in my loser section because the results that I'm seeing from their events are concerning for a country that presumably has Olympic hopes for speed climbing, which is basically a discipline that they invented, right? Like uh, in in my head, they are synonymous, speed climbing and, and 
frankly, like Soviet uh, Soviet era climbing. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, uh, in the end of April, they had one of their all Russian championships, which is kind of like part of a circuit of speed climbing around the country. All the best names usually come out to these things. This one happened to be in Moscow, and they implemented this new program where the Federation set uh, benchmark times. And if athletes hit those benchmark times or faster, they would get extra prize money rather than just the the normal prize money from the event. So let's say you broke a particular uh, time barrier, but you still came like 10th or whatever because you broke it in qualifiers, you'd still get some cash, right? You'd still get some, some you know, thousands and thousands of rubles, which I'm sure is equal to not that much uh, money in Canadian or American dollars right now. I think the prize pool for this, for this uh, bounty, the speed bounty was like 100,000 rubles, which if you calculated is not that much money um but let me let me talk about the speed bounty they set because it's telling that they set this bounty at all here are the times that they were going to celebrate achieving right for the men the goal was you can get some extra money if you break 5.41 okay 5.41 narrowly faster than the world record from six years ago okay 5.41 for the women's the goal was 7.18 Okay, so that's about the record from 2019, all right? So about four years ago. When we got into the competition, Yulia Kaplina was the best woman in the field. She got a 6.94, okay? Um, Ekaterina Barashuk, also a name that people might know. I think she, I'm pretty sure she won a Speed uh, World Cup one time. She got a 6.95, all right? They were the only two that managed to cross that barrier. On the men's side, nobody managed to get past the 5.41 barrier, okay? He was the fastest time he got 5.42. So very close, but they were just crossing these barriers narrowly. Um, none of the men's times from that competition would have made top 16 in Jakarta, all right? Only one of them would have made it top 16 in Seoul. Um, so the Russian men's side is almost looking like not contenders. On the women's side, it's narrowly better, where it's like the, um, uh, like I said, Yulia Kaplina on her very best runs would qualify. Um, and uh, Elizaveta Ivanova on her very best runs would qualify. But again, qualifying at the bottom of that top 16. And so my loser is, and we can talk about why we think this is, my loser is Russia that let's say the, uh, let's say the IOC or the IFSC said today, you know what, Russia, you're invited to world championships. We're going to invite you guys to try and qualify for the Olympics. I don't think they can get it together in time based on the performances that we're seeing in all these comps that they're doing at home. And that's sad historically, but I, uh, I think maybe the lack of motivation from not being able to compete against the best. Um, there's something There's something wrong. They're not the country that they used to be. Um, and the sport has evolved and they're stuck, you know, at home not being able to evolve with it or I don't know. So that's my loser is the Russian climbers, even though they're getting lots of comp experience, uh, it's not showing up and they're not getting anywhere close to the world records right now. Uh I guess mic drop, I guess, or whatever. Well, that's, I guess my reaction is uh, I, I'm not that surprised because you need to be motivated as a competitor, first and foremost. Right. And what is their motivation to win this like a Russian nationals like that's like you need that carrot dangling that you can go on to set world records. You can go and win World Cups. You can go and win the world championships. At this point, if they're if if that's not a possibility, if that's not on the horizon, then I would imagine a lot of these athletes are kind of like, yeah, you know, take it or leave it. Like, I, I mean, I know, I guess the money is a can be a motivator, but I would think for a, for a lot of these athletes that have trained for this for years and years, the, the kind of the big eye in the in the sky, the uh, the prize would be the world record or a world championship or something like that, and they're not allowed to to have that right now, like you said, like that's a whole other discussion, whether mm -hmm. or not people think yeah. that that's, that's a, a merited, but um, I just, yeah, it's like the motivation maybe is not there. So uh, of course they can't push to, to beyond five, four or whatever for the men. If you think about it, like what's the difference between what they're doing at their competitive scene and just having an inner squad meet. It's, yeah. Fair <laughs> enough. It's like, yeah. I, I'm not getting excited for that. If I'm the athlete, like, sure. It might make me a little bit more excited, but you're just racing the same people you're practicing against every day. There's, that's not exciting. Like an athlete doesn't want that. And like so, politics aside, like, like I would, I obviously want more people in the sport uh, to be able to compete. And like, you're right. They were such a, a staple in the speed climbing scene all the way up until 
they're not able to compete. Um, that like it does feel weird without them being here. But again, even if all of a sudden you're right, the door is open. Come on, compete. If they're here, they're not going to do great. That's kind of what I wanted to ask, particularly to you, Josh, just because you do have kind of much more athletic experience than I have ever had. I played one season of soccer when I was five years old, and that's pretty much everything I got. So I'd love your I'd love your input on this. Um, when we talk about this lack of motivation from not really having any goals to achieve, we're we're what like so two and a half months ish away from world championships, right? Which is kind of when we expected the Russians would be allowed into the qualification pathway if they are allowed at all. Let's say it happens like right now. Let's say they're told you guys are welcome to come in. Is is suddenly having that goal enough to up their form, or are they like? Do you think there's a chance that their their form and their their uh, their fitness has kind of atrophied, and that's why the times aren't being put up, or do you think they're just as fit as they always were, and they're just not psyched to like give it their all, kind of thing? Like, if if we open the door right now, are they going to be able to get through it? Sure. So, like, with that short of time frame, maybe, but. Salt Lake City is the next World Cup, and then we're they're off for like for weeks. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't really see them being able to have enough com um, competitions to reach the peak form that they would need to be competitive. And like, when it comes to like peak athleticism for like these speed power events, like speed climbing, anything that's a short sprint, a throw, anything which is like five seconds and under, right? Intensity drives adaptation. So, and I'm sorry, I'm going to get like a little into the weeds here. This, but, is, this like, is what I want. That's, I need that perspective, man. Yeah. So like intensity drives adaptation. You can only be so intense during a practice because it's routine. You don't get the same sort of um, emotional investment into what you're doing because it's routine. Yes. You know, you're practicing, et cetera, and you're working hard, but that's why like you do like an inner squad. Well, now your intensity is going to get raised up a little higher. That's why typically you'll see some inner squad work before the start of the competitive season. Knock the rust off, get raise that intensity. So that way, the first time you experience a World Cup or any like uh, any of those larger meets, that's not the first time you've experienced that intensity. Now you're doing a couple of these World Cups and that's the highest intensity that you've achieved. You're able to then reel back from that and then let your body kind of recover and adapt to that so you can then peak higher than what you've been at, um, especially useful when you're at the Olympic qualifier, which is going to be emotionally the most invested that you've been in the competition since possibly the Olympics if you were there. Um, and they don't have that. They won't have that on ramp of escalating intensity in order to prepare them for that either physically or psychologically. So. What happens if they're welcomed on the World Cup stage? Do you see lots of errors? Do you see that they just can't keep up? I don't know. And like it goes beyond like what they're doing in training because there's just some things you can't replicate in training. It's a uh, my concern is is that it seems like it's probably at the point where the athletes over there probably don't have any faith that they're going to get to the Olympics. Um, you just see some of the Instagram posts from some of the athletes and and I I you know, I don't know exactly how they feel about the requirements that are being put upon Russian athletes if they're to be given permission. Um, they, you know, I, them as a as a sports federation have issued their their uh, protest with what um, what the IOC recommendations are uh, separately, and that's their job as the federation. But I do get the sense that it's kind of like a lost cause for for these athletes. So you know what, it's not going to be our time. Um, we're not in it and and maybe it's just kind of the the ship has sailed in their mind and uh and that's really sad but um yeah that's uh that's just kind of what, what i wanted to bring up was kind of a missed missed historic opportunity unfortunately um for good or for bad i, I don't know it's up to you um yeah um any of you guys have any anything else that you want to throw in as honorable mentions for this for for losers for winners for headlines anything else you guys want to briefly discuss <laughs> I've got a real quick one, and it's another loser for the camera work. Um, uh, Yun Chol's uh, oh, race yes. in finals wasn't even shown. Like, yeah, camera person just like looking at them, like parallel with the wall, like the great yeah. intense shot. And they go, and then dudes just film in the mat, and they don't switch yeah. cameras. Yeah, and yeah. I'm like, come on, you have one job. It reminded me of uh, the Looney Tunes cartoon where the, you know, the, the, just like the Roadrunner or whatever, like runs and there's nothing there except for this cloud of smoke. Yep. And, yeah. it's like, and it's just like what it was. No one, no one is there anymore. Um, my, my loser, I, I had to put Jin Bao Long on here and 
this just shows you how uh, how little room there is right. for like a little margin of error, right? Because Jin Bao didn't have a, a bad comp at all. He advanced to the final round and then he he lost in the first bracket in a ridiculously close race to uh, Peng Wu, his teammate. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Peng Wu ran a five. 16 and Jin Bao was a 525. So like re- really close. Um but that loss just happened to be enough to bump Jin Bao down to 12th, uh which was way lower I think than we would expect to see Jin Bao this season, especially considering he was a silver medalist in Seoul. Uh this 12th place was his worst World Cup showing since since Chamonix uh 2019 I think where he was 22nd. So wow. um no, I'll put him in my loser category this week, but you got to put somebody get, in there, you know. <laughs> get, get in twelfth place, though. There's there's athletes on the circuit that would that would love that would be a you know a, a career best at this point to get there. So uh, take it all with a grain of salt. But yeah, I'll stick him there for this week. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Any anything else? Any uh, any final uh, remarks that you guys uh, want to drop in? If not. We can just wrap it and say, uh, make sure you check out Josh's channel for for all the good analysis. Uh, again, like I mentioned, the splits by themselves are, are what I find fascinating. But I loved your preseason show with Sam Watson and Albert Oak. So if there are uh, any Sam Watson fans that haven't seen that yet, make sure you check it out. It is nice to hear a speed athlete talk about uh, talk about the scene, which is cool because most athletes they really just talk about themselves, not so much not so much willing to you know speculate on uh, on the sport itself. But Sam's pretty intelligent kid and uh, and pretty good for content like that yeah i really like that interview um we're taking a week off uh salt lake city is is two weeks away so we've got a little break so everybody make sure you refresh yourself and then finally these world cups come into a time zone that isn't torture for the three of us at the very least um so take a little bit of time off make sure you check out the plastic weekly discord where you can chat about all of the comps and get ready for salt lake city you can support this podcast on patreon in the link below you can buy john's book and of course you can always like and subscribe so more people People find content like this. Otherwise, we'll see you guys for Salt Lake City. That's going to be about a week and a half. Thanks for watching.